Hi everyone, it's Dr. Julio Novoa. Hi everyone, it's Danielle. Okay, so today's subject is going to be about what we call the sexual alphabet. So a lot of patients have questions related to um, the different erogenous zones. Hold on, wait till we get people on. I don't have anybody yet. One. Hello. Yeah, give it a few minutes. Okay, we'll give it a few minutes. So I still got to gotta share all this. Did you share it there? No. Give us a few minutes to share the videos. I think we have to switch places because you know how to do this and I know. Go to the video. Scroll down. You can see it here. Look. Oh. Okay. Go to share. Right there. I don't know what to do. I was like, what are you doing? I know, I'm looking. Share. And then you're going to go to. You're going to go to share in a group. And then you're going to type in E. <clears throat> I think E shore and the uh, post tubal ligation. Uh, type in e, e. So E and then E shore. Uh, e shore problems. And then. Did you turn off the fan? No, air? it's hot in here. This is this room. There's so yeah, many windows. Right and then you're going to go share um, to a page. Um, post to long is this. Okay. Post. Sorry, y'all. We're just posting the video. And then share again. Share to a page. Scroll down. Hold on. There's one more post to like this. Hold on. Turn, turn the air on. on. Wow, it's... The air is, is constantly turning on. And then... Okay. Did you get it? I think so. Is that too loud? No. Why isn't it moving? moving here because we're live that's all that matters let me go ahead you can start talking okay i'm sorry it just took a little while to get uh, everything started so i i had i got a question last week related to um sexual intercourse after having either a tubal ligation or a hysterectomy and it was very concerning because a lot of patients have issues with uh with some type of change in, in their sexual response or their desire after um, a tubal ligation or after a hysterectomy. And, and actually, this really does change uh, even with having a child, having a baby. And so it's not something that is commonly talked about, but it's something that is very, very common. And uh, it's not just associated with postpartum blues or just physical exhaustion. There is actually uh, hormonal changes that occur related to uh, having a baby or um, than having your tubes tied or having a hysterectomy. And so uh, that has to be understood that it's not about not desiring your, your partner or your husband. Uh, it's about simply there's, there's uh, hormonal changes that occur uh, with any of the three subjects that I just uh, mentioned. And this is why it's important to try to work your way through it and understand that hopefully it's only going to be temporary, but sometimes it is something that is long long term or even permanent and that's why we wanted to address those particular uh, symptoms or signs and management of, of those particular conditions. So first of all, it's perfectly normal to not want to have sex after you have a baby. Um, mothers happen to be very exhausted. They have to get up every one to two hours. Um, I, Danielle had to go through that one to two hours after a baby's born. They constantly feed uh, the baby. You're breastfeeding and so your hormones are uh, your estrogen level is completely uh, lowered and uh, lactation, uh, it, although there's a bonding with the child, uh, lactation is not something that's always, um, doesn't make you feel necessarily, make you feel sexy. And so between exhaustion, between postpartum uh, blues, uh, between lactation, you're going to notice changes after you have a baby. Now these same 
types of changes can occur after a tubal ligation, which is uh, if it's long term occurring in two and five per, to five percent of patients, you're going to have the post tubal ligation syndrome, and uh, that's what we address or we talk about as well. Now, whenever you manipulate either an ovary or the uterus, you can have a reduction in the amount of normal hormone uh, production of the ovaries and therefore a change in the sexual drive. Uh, that's not commonly discussed. So if you have your ovary removed because you had a cyst or if you had a cystotomy uh, done, removing just the cyst but you leave a portion of the ovary behind, you have about a 5 to 15% chance that the other ovary is not going to work like it's supposed to or a total failure of both ovaries uh, can, uh, can occur after you remove a cyst or after you have a cyst hysterectomy. Now we're not really sure why that happens because the blood flow to either one of the ovaries is not, not supposed to be compromised because each one has an independent blood flow from, from its own artery, uh, but it does happen. And so if you're planning on having surgery for the removal of an ovary or a cyst, you have to keep in mind that that's a possibility. If you have your tubes tied, although the studies don't suggest that the hormone levels really change that much, I think that, it, it, that the post-tubal ligation syndrome is associated with uh, a, um, an inflammatory response, uh, a scarring effect, and that's what changes the hormonal response uh, uh, with post-tubal ligation syndrome. And with hysterectomy, that's more complicated, but uh, having a hysterectomy does uh, can affect the hormonal production and can also put you into early menopause or, or a pre-menopausal pre, uh, uh, menopausal state. So this is, an, uh, this is very important to understand. So some of the patients had questions related, well, what are you supposed to do about this? Aside from uh, getting your hormones checked to make sure that they're in a normal level, and this is what's kind of complicated, you can have a normal level of hormones and still be not normal for you. So although the paperwork says that you're in the normal range, it's still possible that you're not, your hormones are not normal for your, your particular body. And you notice this, something that is hard to explain to doctors because they kind of say, well, your, your labs look for, uh, normal, and so there's nothing wrong. And of course there is because you feel it. You notice that there's something wrong. So just because your hormone levels are normal doesn't mean that they're normal for you. And therefore, uh, you have to keep that in mind and, and seek counseling, uh, not necessarily from the GYN, because GYN doctors are not really experts in sexual therapy. And so you should always consider getting a, a consult with, with a sexual therapist related to this. Now, uh, the, the, uh, the next thing you want to do is you, you want to determine what, what could you change in order to make you feel better about uh, the sexual drive. Absolutely, if you're uh, taking care of a child, it's very hard to feel sexy when you're tired. And it's hard to feel sexy when you're within earshot of the baby. Uh, especially if you live, live in a small home, it's hard to really let it all hang out when the baby's in the next room, okay? Whether or not you're thinking or worried about, <laughs> thinking or worried about waking up the baby uh, or uh, waking up your, your other children or waking up your in-laws. Uh, it's, it, that's kind of hard to be kind of muffled, muffle everything. The, my recommendation has always been try to get someone to babysit the, uh, your, ch your children and just take a little, a little mini uh, vacation on the weekends for just you and your husband or you and your partner. Now, frankly, Friday, if it's going to be Friday, Saturday, Sunday, frankly, Friday, it's, it's shot. Friday, you're just making up for trying to, to get some sleep. That's basically what's happening on a Friday. Uh, but on Saturday, then the two of you can get together. Now you're rejuvenated. You're feeling better. Uh, you've already made the phone call to uh, making sure the kids are okay. And then it's more of, a, of an enjoying yourself, drinking, drinking or socializing, uh, uh, and then becoming more romantic. It's something that you lost uh, before, uh, before the baby came. What you had before the baby came, you want to try to get back after the baby's born. Now... Everything should be slow because you're not trying to take a test. You're basically just trying to enjoy yourself, and this is very, very important. So on Saturday and Sunday, I've always suggested that take, take the, two week, the two days on the weekend, and by Sunday, you would have, have relaxed, enjoyed yourself, really gotten, uh, gotten back into, this, in, into the remembering how it used to be, and then be ready to go and take care of the kids again on the Sunday. Now, if it's not possible... Maybe someone can take care of the children for just a few hours, but 
it's very hard to be romantic, intimate, or even spontaneous when the children are in the next room, or even if they're down the hall, because here comes your little three-year-old knocking on the door, wondering why, why they can't come in, and of course that kind of ruins it for a, a lot of times. So keep that in mind as, as some important uh, things to consider. Now, I wanted to go over some anatomy because most people, most women, don't really know what they look like in the vaginal vulva area. And uh, even if they put a mirror, they're really kind of confused sometimes. Or there's a certain percentage of women that have never seen what they look like down there. And therefore, we wanted to go over the anatomy because in order to understand what the different erogenous zones are, you have to understand your anatomy. So, mind you, it should be, you should take a look at all of this in private, make sure the door is locked, make sure you're not going to be disturbed, and just get a, a nice sized mirror and take a look down there. So, what are we talking about when we're talking about the vulva? Well, the vulva is everything on the outside, basically, that's just above the, um, your, your anus, okay? So, in that area, in the pubic hairline, uh, uh, below the pubic hairline and just above the anus is generally considered to be the vulva. And uh, you have the labia majora, which are the, the more puffy areas, and the labia minora, which are the thin lips. And that's, that's the external appearance of the vulva. Now, just inside of that, and just before you get to the vagina, you also have structures uh, uh, that are associated with uh, the vulva, uh, but are anatomically obviously different than the vagina. And so we're going to go over that uh, um, in, in a moment. So any questions so far? No, they're just listening. Right they're now. just listening. Okay. So this is going to become, Oh, by the way, uh, I wanted to make sure that we have posted our videos with Danielle and I, we started posting them on YouTube. So if you're interested, you don't have to scroll down on Facebook any longer. You can go to YouTube. Now it's going to take me about half an hour to post this video after we're done. But if you wanted to take, uh, um, if you don't want to take notes and you want to take a look at it later, feel free to. It'll be posted on YouTube. You just type in Julio Novoa MD, uh, Julio Cesar Novoa MD as my name, or you can post uh, or ask the question, uh, Dr. Novoa and Danielle, and you can see the subject. Today's subject is um, sexual alphabet. Okay, so this is rated uh, R for mature audiences, and I'm not sure whether or not it's going to, it's going to, we're going to be able to see it very well, but Oh, I'm sorry. I should have told you, warned you ahead of time. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look. All right. So, number one is your clitoris. Now, number one, obviously, I'm going from top to bottom. So, the first line is the clitoris. The second line is, oh, I'm sorry. The first one is the clitoral hood that covers the clitoris. Okay, basically, it's little coat. Number two is the clitoris itself. Now, in this particular picture, it's kind of a little bit hidden, but sometimes it can look like a, a little P, a little pink P, or a tiny penis. That's the, uh, the equivalent to the male penis, or some would suggest that that's what it is. Number three are the labia minora. Now, in this particular patient, it's not that prominent, but some ladies can have rather prominent size labia. Number four, right here, is the urethra. That's where you urinate from, okay? Number five is the vagina itself, that, that little circled opening. Number six is the perineum or the perineal body. And number seven is the anus. Now, what are we most interested in? Obviously, one of the most important erogenous zones is going to be the brain or your, your mind, and so you have to really want to uh, care about the person that you're with. Or I always talk about uh, relationships as to make sure that you don't resent your partner because even if you love your partner, if you resent them for whatever reason, you're not really going to enjoy sex as much as you have done in the past. And that has to do with uh, how you feel about them, how they've treated you, social economic issues, whether or not there's been infidelity, that's very important. Okay, so number two, of course, uh, is the clitoris. So obviously that's one of the erogenous zones, uh, uh, considered to be the most important erogenous zones because stimulation is important there. And then although number four 
where is where is the urethra where you urinate from there's two little small glands on each side of the urethra which are called the skein gland opening and the skein glands are associated with the first erogenous zone that we're going to talk about today the skein glands and the first erogenous zone and this is a little a closer look at that okay so right here is where you urinate from and right next to it is a little dot a little opening called the skein gland opening okay and that is there's one on each side and that is the U spot so if you're trying to figure it out that's where the U spot is so if you stimulate that particular area you can not only get a fluid to come out which is commonly associated with what you would call a squirter or a gusher uh, that is where the fluid comes from from the skein glands okay and that is called the U spot so on our sexual alphabet I'm going from the outside to the inside and so the first one no, the first one's the, the mind the number two is going to be the clitoris number three is the U spot okay that's where the U spot is located the next spot which uh, happens to have uh, happens to be discussed very often is going to be the graphene uh, spot or the G spot now the Grabenberg spot is actually a little bit hard to uh, uh, it's not it's not hard to find but you have to know what you're looking for okay so on a graph drawing from the side view it's located just behind the pubic bone so if you were to place your fingers or your partner were to place his or her fingers inside of your vagina they're going to feel this hard structure which is the pubic bone the pubic bone is part of your anatomy obviously that's your your pelvis so you're gonna place your fingers inside of the vagina feel for the pubic bone go just below and behind the pubic bone and now you're in the track of where the g-spot will be located so the g-spot is generally located about one centimeter beyond or behind the pubic bone and that's usually felt as a little mound of tissue that has a little downward projection uh, and it's a little bit different it feels a little bit firmer and it feels like about the size of a quarter that is the g-spot and why it's in, it's important is because it is a the Grappenberg spot or the g-spot is important as far as stimulation so direct stimulation on it but it's very very close to to your to the urethra and so if you're stimulating it correctly many times you're going to want your partner to stop stimulating you because you feel like you have to you have to pee like you have to urinate and so you have to get used to the stimulation uh, and generally a frontward to back to, to a back to front or circular motion on the g-spot is enough stimulation to uh, notice that you're you're in, becoming more aroused to the point of orgasm okay so that is the second of the alphabet sexual alphabet which is called the g-spot now in our little model here which I um, I got from the office so I hope you can see this anyway so this is the outside the vulva here is you can't see it here so I'm gonna I'm gonna flip this around so now here's the vulva here is the vagina so the pubic bone is right about here so when you place your fingers inside and you push up you're gonna feel the pubic bone and this right about in here is where the g-spot is located so if you go forward and back or in a circular motion you're gonna get stimulation of the g-spot but mind you it is very close to the urethra and therefore or to the bladder and therefore if you're stimulating it your partner will or you will generally feel like you want to pee that generally will go away that sensation will go away and this is why experimentation and uh, expression is not a rush job you have to do it slowly you have to do it with uh, care and you have to be open-minded and listen to what your partner is asking you to do 
So that's the G spot. The next uh, spot of the alphabet is going to be the A spot or the anterior fornix. Now, if you go further into the vagina, you're going to notice you're going to come across the cervix. This is the opening to the womb. This is where you get your pap smears done. This is the cervix. So the cervix looks like a little circle. So if you were imagining that the entire uterus and cervix look like an upside down pear, and you move the pear so that you're looking at the, the end where the stem is, that little circle, circle of tissue is called the cervix. And above the cervix, above the cervix is called a little space called the anterior fornix. This is where the A spot is located. That's where the A spot is located. The next letter of the alphabet is going to be the P spot. The P spot is located behind the cervix and what's called the posterior fornix back here. So, and what's interesting is you can see that there's this little space here, this gap of area. This is how a woman is able to accommodate different size uh, penises. Okay, this area can stretch out and allow for an accommodation of anywhere between just a very short penis to very long penises can go. And this is where it goes. It goes, it stretches this particular area out. And so with deep penetration, a lot of women can notice a stimulation of the P-spot. Now, it doesn't mean that you have to have a, a very big or a very long penis to stimulate the P-spot, but that is what it's stimulating, this particular area back here. So you're talking about the clitoris on the outside, the U-spot, which are uh, the skiing glands, the G-spot, which is just uh, behind the pubic bone. The A-spot, which is just above the cervix. And the P-spot, which is just below the cervix back here. So that's the alphabet. Now, someone asked a question is, do you have to stimulate all of these areas? No, you don't. Every person is unique. Every person likes something slightly different than another person. And there's nothing wrong with only enjoying clitoral stimulation orgasms, and there's nothing wrong with only enjoying vaginal stimulation orgasms. What's important is to understand that you should change it up a bit and understand the anatomy, understand what you're talking, what, what the different parts of the body, and, and experiment to find out what your partner really likes. If you didn't know that the G-spot existed, but you were having your, your partner being male or female by that matter, was stimulating that area, but you said, I don't know what you just did, but it was fantastic. The person, the other person says, I don't know what I did either. So, but if you have an idea and you keep repeating it, that's how you get better and better uh, of expressing yourself and, and your partner really enjoys that when you take the time to go over these particular areas. So you don't have to stimulate all of the areas and it might, mind you, it might be that one particular area is super sensitive that you don't even want that person to touch that particular area. And that's the key to keeping this in mind. Now, uh, different positions uh, provide different levels of stimulation, different widths of, the, of a male partner uh, or, um, or lengths of a male partner, or if you're using toys, different sizes and shapes of toys stimulate different areas. The key is to understand what you want, be expressive about it, have your partner and yourself be open-minded about it, and then you get a better understanding and better, better enjoyment out of it. And do not rush it. You do not want to rush this. It's, you're having fun. Okay, It's not a roller coaster ride, although it could be. But uh, you're, you're not looking for a, a two-minute stimulation. You're looking for 30 minutes, 40 minutes. Uh, and this is what foreplay is all about. And especially for men, if you enhance your repertoire, this is what you're looking for. It's not, for all intents and purposes, a wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. It is, that's how women take a lot longer to become sexually aroused, and they take longer to orgasm. And many times, uh, up to... 70% of the time, a woman will not orgasm 
uh, every single time. She, she can orgasm, but there's going to be a good 30% of the time where a woman will not orgasm uh, even though their partner has. And that's frustrating to a lot of women. So that's very important to understand. Uh, the next thing we're going to talk about is um, can you stimulate all of the areas at the same time? And yes, you can. You can stimulate the areas all at the same time, but generally it will require not from uh, sexual intercourse, but with the use of your fingers and with the use of your mouth with cunnilingus. And that's key to understand there too. But it can, the, patient, the person can be oversensitized, so you have to be very careful and very slow to get to understand exactly what they're what they want and how they're how much they're enjoying what you're doing so that's very important so sexual toys uh, I don't necessarily recommend a particular toy but the mighty mites which are small devices that look about the size of a, of, of a, a little flashlight the mighty mite is a vibrator that you could apply directly to the clitoris and um, uh, that uh, direct stimulation is very very uh, uh, very, very intense for some women, uh, and that they enjoy that. that. So the Mighty Mite would be an example of, of something for external stimulation. Now, for internal stimulation, of course, you can use uh, a vibrator or a dildo, and there are combination devices, such as the Rabbit, which is a combination of both an external stimulation plus a rotation of a, of a, of a mechanical vibrator, and, of course, it vibrates as well. These devices, of course, you can have, you can go to a, a, a sex party. I don't recommend you go to a sex party because they're going to charge you 50 to 70% more than what you can buy online. For example, if you go to Adam and Eve uh, and type in Adam with the a little sign for and Eve, uh, you're going to find uh, sexual devices on that website for very, very low prices and very discreet. They send it to you in a little brown box and it's... Uh, you can keep it to yourself and to, with your partner rather than going to a sex party and paying a hundred dollars for 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 the rabbit for example which you can get online or go through the website for about thirty or forty dollars um, and so this is key and always if you're going to be using toys always make sure that you're cleaning them afterwards It's very very important to do that now my next point is related to what happens after a tubal ligation or hysterectomy it's a very important question specifically for hysterectomy to ask, to be asked. I always ask my patients, if you're going to want a hysterectomy or you're going to need a hysterectomy, what are the areas that m most often stimulate you to reach orgasm? Are you most stimulated by, by a, a clitoral orgasm or an external orgasm stimulation? Or do you get most of your stimulation or need the stimulation vaginally to be able to orgasm. This is keyly important because if you have a hysterectomy and you orgasm more, most often from a vaginal orgasm, the removal of the cervix can sometimes delay or change your sexual sensitivity and therefore it might be a better option to leave the cervix behind as part of a subtotal hysterectomy, removing just the uterus along with the fallopian tubes and, if necessary, the ovaries, but you leave the cervix behind. Uh, that will maintain or uh, allow you to maintain as much of the vaginal nerve ending integrity that you had before if you're going to need a hysterectomy. Now, that doesn't affect, if you're a clitoral uh, orgasm pay, uh, person, then of a, a, a vaginal hysterectomy or a hysterectomy removing the cervix may not change things too much, which is very important as well to understand that. Now, as far as the tubules are concerned, as far as any other procedures that, that manipulate or change the, the, the fallopian tubes, including East Shore devices, it's, it's, it's very important to understand that although we don't understand how it changes uh, and why it changes, the sexual drive changes, it does change in some women and you basically have to relearn what, what you enjoy or you're going to have to figure out a different way to sti be stimulated which you're going to enjoy hopefully just as much or even more than it was before the tubal was done. One important thing is for patients that have uh, vaginal meshes, whether or not they'll be urethral meshes or vaginal meshes, please understand that if you have an artificial device such as a vaginal mesh, that vaginal mesh permanently changes 
the thickness and sensitivity of the vaginal mucosa permanently. It almost feels like leather. I, when I've done a pelvic exam on a patient with a vaginal mesh, I know that she has a vaginal mesh because it feels like leather in there. And they can notice a significant and permanent change to their ability to enjoy intercourse. And it becomes worse over time if the vaginal mesh becomes inflamed, infected, or extrudes, starts to uh, erode its way through into the vagina where the patient can't even have sex anymore, that's part of the inflammatory response. So it's very important that you, not con you, you consider carefully before you allow someone to put a vaginal mesh or a urethral mesh inside of your body because it can, can permanently alter your ability to enjoy intercourse or actually it can cause pain when you have intercourse. So, any questions so far? Uh, there was one. I feel as if my perineum area burns after intercourse every single time. Could it be that part of my previous episiotomy could be reopening, or what could cause that pain? Okay. Unfortunately, this is very important. We as as gonic as OBGYNs no longer recommend um, prophylactic episiotomies. Most of the time, for example, when I'm trying to deliver a patient vaginally, I massage the area to stretch it out as much as possible to avoid cutting. An episiotomy is a surgical cut. That means that it leaves permanent scar tissue in that area. And therefore, some women are sensitized to that area for the rest of their life. For the rest of their life. It's, it's always going to be a sensitive area. So you should always, if you're going to have a, a baby and you want to have a vaginal delivery, you should always request to the doctor... Avoid doing an episiotomy as much as they can. Obviously, there's going to be cases where you need to have an episiotomy. But unfortunately, we have been doing some surveys, not necessarily me, but the OBGYN community. And there are a significant number of hospitals that still have anywhere between a 50 to 70% episiotomy rate when it should be less than 10%. So that's key. The area that you're talking about from your perineum, the area of, uh, let me go back to the first drawing. The perineum, <clears throat> and this is why it was important. This is the perineum, and you're going to cut an episiotomy either left or right or down the middle. This area can become permanently sensitized from an episiotomy cut, and it's not quite the same as far as elasticity or natural stretch as the other areas, and therefore when you're having intercourse, that stretching effect can burn or cause burning sensation uh, when you're having intercourse. Another key thing to uh, remember is that maybe that area is a little bit too tight or maybe it needs to be modified a little bit. Sometimes a, uh, just a, a minor uh, a correction is all that's needed. I've seen some doctors close a, a perineum and they li leave this little area of skin above the vaginal opening. That little area of skin is called a band. And if you have a band, every time you put pressure on the band, it burns. It causes a burning sensation. That band needs to be cut and to keep the opening to the vagina pristine so that it doesn't have to be stretched out. It doesn't feel that tearing sensation associated with, with an episiotomy that, that hasn't healed properly. So that's key as far as that is concerned and what needs to be done with as far as episiotomy. You make a good point, however. Whenever a patient that, that I see has issues related to... Um, uh, pain with intercourse uh, or excessive va vaginal discharge with intercourse, following intercourse, we always, or, or a bad smell or anything like that associated with bacterial vaginosis, we always run STD panel, including microplasma and urea plasma. A lot of doctors, I would have to say greater than 90% of doctors, GYN doctors, don't run tests for microplasma or urea plasma, which are very important to rule out any discharge, infection, sensitivity, uh, or sensitivity to the vaginal area. So key point to remember, microplasma, urea plasma screening test, if you're having chronic vaginal discharge issues, pain with intercourse, uh, or, or something of, or a burning sensation related to having intercourse. The next thing, it's very important to make sure that you're well lubricated. And I always recommend that patients have a little bottle of what's called Astroglide uh, um, by the bedside. Astroglide comes in a clear bottle with a purple top. You can buy it at Walgreens or Walmart. They sell it in, uh, at the, uh, where they sell condoms. And 
Astroglide, uh, the purple kind, not the red kind, because that heats up just like KY, uh, his and hers, they heat up. Don't use the ones that heat up because it can cause irritation. Astroglide is, is a clear solution. It's water-based, so it doesn't have a bad smell. It doesn't have a bad taste. It doesn't stain the sheets because you can just wash it right out with a little cloth. Uh, and you can use as much of it as you want as far as lubrication is concerned. So if you're not feeling well, if you're feeling dry, you apply a little bit to yourself, apply a little bit to your partner, and then you engage in intercourse, and you're going to notice that it feels much better, and it lasts quite a bit of time. If you need some more, you can always apply a little bit more. So that might also help for that issue related to the burning sensation that you're noticing when you're having intercourse or after having intercourse. No, that was, that was the other question. That was it? Okay. Last question I was asked was related to orgasm itself. Uh, there are some women, unfortunately, 10 to 15% of women never have an orgasm. They, they can be in their 50s, 60s, married 20 years, and they have never had an orgasm. Most of the time, the simplest uh, question, the first question to ask is, do you, very intimate question, however, do you masturbate? And if you masturbate, are you able to achieve orgasm? If you're able to achieve orgasm from masturbation, you've answered 90% of all the questions related to it. There is nothing anatomically wrong. There is not, there's no nerve issues going on that's a problem. There is a performance situation going on. Either it's a, 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 an issue with the, the having intercourse with that particular partner uh, or, or the such. So if you learn your own body, the key thing to remember is that men are generally clueless uh, when it comes to sex. You have to tell them what you like and many times explain it. And they have the males, the men have to be open-minded. I, I often describe it and I, I joke about it, but I often describe men as being a, a bugle. It's just one, one instrument. Okay, one basically way of playing it, the instrument. And I describe women as being more like a piano. There are so many different keys that you can press to, to get uh, a response. And that's the difference in the complexity between males and females. So nevertheless, when we're talking about orgasm itself, um, you have to know more about your body than your partner does. And that takes some time, some privacy to understand that and an open mind from your partner to be able to to better be able to enjoy it. Now, if you're able to orgasm uh, uh, through masturbation, great. The next question is, can you orgasm more than once? And there are some women that are multi-orgasmic. They're able to uh, have one orgasm and then shortly thereafter have a second orgasm. Now, this is very different from men because the, the vast majority of men need a refractory period. And they, a lot of people joke around, they need about half an hour or an, a whole night's sleep to be able to get ready for the next time they're going to have intercourse. Women are, are anatomically and uh, physiologically different where women can uh, achieve orgasm from uh, back to back. They can, and it can be either just a, a few minutes apart or even just a few seconds apart. And that is the difference between uh, being single orgasmic or uh, uh, only orgasming once to multi orgasm uh, being multi orgasmic. They can multiply. They can have more more than one orgasm. Now, it generally speaking, if a woman is multi orgasmic, uh, she can usually do that through masturbation or with the use of toys because the, the toys are like a male who can usually only go just a few minutes before orgasming and then he can't use his penis anymore. With the toys you can go much longer than that and you can experiment and understand what, what stimulates you the most. So if we're, if we're understanding being multi-orgasmic, usually if you're multi-orgasmic, the next orgasm is generally easier to achieve than the previous one. And sometimes it can be even more sensitive than the previous one. Now this tends to be something like a step ladder. So if, you're, if you are multi-orgasmic, you can have one orgasm that took a little while to, to achieve. And then if you're able to be multi-orgasmic, the next one is a little bit easier to achieve and maybe a little bit more intense to achieve. And then we get to the next concept, which is called systemic, systemic orgasmic stimulation, or I call SOS. Now, with that, rather than stopping when, a, when, a, when your partner or a woman has had an orgasm, you continue 
to stimulate the particular area either through uh, penile penetration or through uh, uh, using your fingers or your mouth or a combination of the three. Uh, and then that will allow the patient to continuously feel stimulation and then the next orgasm comes faster and more intense and is almost like a step ladder or almost like going up the stairs. Each orgasm that comes after the previous one is more intense and usually shorter to achieve if you can reach SOS. Now, when do you really reach or plateau at SOS? Just like walking up the stairs? If you can have it continuously one back to back, continuously one after another after another, the intensity is so intense and the orgasm is so intense that the patient has shortness of breath and may even uh, faint from that type of stimulation. It takes a lot of trust in the person themselves and a lot of understanding between the partners to be able to achieve SOS. But it is possible uh, to, to reach, an, reach a plateau or a sustained orgasmic stimulation plateau where that person will have a continued orgasm for 15, 20 seconds, even 30 seconds, uh, and then sometimes they just faint because they're just not able to take a breath. But that are, is the last subject that I wanted to talk about in answering what are the, what's the sexual alphabet? Uh, how do things change after a tubal and hysterectomy or cyst cystotomy or cystectomy? Uh, what are the areas of the body that need to be stimulated? And um, basically, what is uh, SOS? So I think that uh, that's all this, uh, I needed to talk about. Um, someone asked if the pe why when the penis goes deep, there's pain. Oh, because the, the, it's more associated with length than with uh, girth, although girth can obviously cause discomfort. But as I was describing... Uh, in this particular model, okay, if the penis goes very deep, it can hit the posterior fornix, the area in the back that's meant to accommodate length, and it pushes against the, uh, the P spot, pushes against the cervix, can push against the rectum, and these can cause pain. In about 10% of women, rather than their, their, uh, their, uh, uteruses pointing upward or towards the belly button. Now, mind you, if you're if you're lying on your and this is your butt. If you're lying on your butt, okay, and this is your vagina or your vulva, your belly button is about right up in here. Okay, so if the top of your uh, uterus points towards your belly button, that's considered an antiverted uterus, and that is the most common type of uterus points in that direction. Now, you can also have a flexion or a curvature of the uterus in a downward uh, position or even straight or downward, but the more intense ones are going to be when they point straight down. So if, you're, if the top of your uterus points straight down and your partner enters you vaginally and his penis hits the back of your, uh, your, um, your uterus because it's pointing down, because that's where it's right here, rather than be here, it's here, it can literally lift your, your uterus up and cause pain. So it all depends on the length, the girth, and the position of pressure, and exactly where is your cervix positioned and where is and how is your uterus positioned that is um, dependent on uh, sensitivity, uh, stimulation, and pain. I always recommend that, that uh, women that are noticing pain when they're having intercourse be the ones to control the rhythm. And the best way to control the rhythm or penetration is for the woman to be on top in the uh, cowgirl, what's called the cowgirl position. And reverse cowgirl is rather than you be on top and you're facing your partner, the reverse cowgirl is when you're on top and you're facing away from your partner, like facing, looking towards their feet. That's reverse cowgirl. But I think the, the, the best control for a woman that's trying to avoid pain is to be on top facing your partner. 
Um, also, if you do the traditional positions of the missionary position, that's going to probably be the deepest penetration, especially if you're going with what's called a pike position or where the legs are up on, on your partner's uh, shoulders. That's going to provide the deepest penetration, and the angle may be a little bit too uncomfortable for some patients, especially if their uterus is point downward towards their rectum. You looking for questions? Yeah. Nothing yet. That's it. That's all I got so far. Okay. Well, just some minor uh, comments. Number one, uh, some women notice that uh, if you remove the clitoral hood, the ability to orgasm intensifies. The, the caveat with that is that if you remove too much literal of the, of the hood, you can become overstimulated, and then the clitoris becomes sensitized oh, uh, even with walking. And so that's kind of a, a concern. Uh, there have been some cases where with hysterectomy, the patient not only enjoys uh, having sex afterwards better than they did before, but they can actually, their, their orgasms are much more intense, which is unique to the individual. It doesn't happen with everybody, but most women that have had hysterectomies because of chronic pelvic pain, uh, vaginal bleeding, uterine fibroids, they tend to enjoy intercourse a lot better when they don't have the uterus any longer because that's not an obstacle to uh, to enjoying sex. So that's a key point there. Uh, the next thing is modifications of the labia uh, to make them smaller tend not to change the ability to orgasm or enjoyment of orgasm. Um, vaginal rejuvenation surgery where you modify the, 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 the how narrow the vagina is can intensify uh, vaginal stimulation. And, and a part of that is because the smaller the vagina is, the more pressure it is placed up against the G-spot. And that is something that a lot of women in, uh, enjoy. So, for example, I do uh, vaginal rejuvenation surgery and I do virginal size restoration surgery, which basically turns a woman back into a virginal size, just one finger size. And uh, they, they have to be, they stretch back out to the size of their partner, but they do notice a significant improvement in the intensity of orgasm by doing that. Uh, I don't really recommend G uh, G-shot amplification or G-spot amplification because the collagen that's used to make the G-spot thicker is only temporary. It lasts only a year or a couple years and sometimes just doing a modified vaginal rejuvenation surgery will last you a lot longer than that. So that's key related to uh, uh, the, the surgeries that are associated with uh, sexual stimulation. And um, I think we're good. All right. Yep. Okay. So I hope you enjoyed the, uh, the discussion today. I hope I answered those questions for those ladies that are, have issues related to post-tubal ligation syndrome uh, and um, hysterectomy and try to explain why the sexual drive changes. Oh, last things. Yes, um, what, once you have evaluated a patient for estrogen levels and uh, we do, we, uh, I do, I recommend many times for a patient to consider using a combination of estrogen and testosterone. Normally, testosterone is given to men, but for women that are suffering from a condition known as hypoactive sexual desire disorder, uh, basically they don't, they don't desire sex uh, anymore uh, or as much as they used to, uh, to, um, to consider uh, using testosterone. And there's a couple uh, medications that have recently come out on the market that are supposed to make you more desire intercourse more. I haven't really seen that they, they work as well as they've been advertised and they do have side effects to those, but that's for a different subject. Okay. Thank you so much. I hope that I've explained it well enough for you to understand what the sexual alphabet is all about. And, um, if you have any questions, feel free to, uh, comment and we will, we will be posting this on YouTube and you can see all of our other videos or my videos on YouTube. And, uh, Hopefully we can do another um, presentation for something that you, you're interested in. Yes? Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Bye. Have a nice day.